think about it as rabbits. If you add more rabbits to that cage, there will be more rabbits in the cage, but unless you feed them, they will die off. But on the other aspect of it is, if you have a cage, you have two rabbits, a male and a female. If you start feeding them, eventually they start duplicating really fast. A lot of the time, it is more important to feed the good gut bacteria we have than maybe adding more bacteria in. I want people to start asking more why, why, why. If you are struggling with gut issues, ask why. We need to start thinking about that our body is built up with cells. A healthy body begins with healthy cells. When we're able to ask enough of why questions, we always come down to the cell. Is our cells working? Are they functioning? So I want to change the way we're looking at health. Hi, Envisioners. It's Nicole Nguyen here. Welcome to the Envisioner podcast. This is the podcast where we envision living our best lives by exploring everyday topics related to health, wealth, and community. On today's episode, we have Mikaela Morel, who is a Swedish nutritionist, entrepreneur, as well as mother of three. She has a true passion for understanding the body on a cellular level and has an expertise in inflammation, cell health, and gut health. She started her company called Food Changes Lives to help people get educated on their own nutrition journey and she continues to create and promote self-education by using Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube to help people learn about and take control of their own health. Today, Michaela will be speaking with us about the very topical issue of gut health and why we should start taking action now to heal our bodies. I am really excited to learn more about this topic. So welcome, Mikaela, onto the Envisioner podcast. Thank you so much for being part of this podcast. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for having this discussion today. I think it's so important. Yes, right? I always like to start the podcast and the listeners love to hear our guests' background stories. I have read a bit on your website and I'd love to hear more about your very interesting entrepreneur and cross-continental background. So please tell us a little bit about your childhood and your journey from Sweden to the US and into the health industry. So growing up, I was an entrepreneur from start. I was six years old when I understood that if I have to pay money for purchasing a rabbit, I can also earn money from purchasing, I mean, from selling rabbits. So I actually started at six years old breeding rabbits. And uh, I come wow. from a family that did not have any money. So I was always finding ways to create money for myself. And that my rabbit <laughs> business grew to guinea pigs and hamsters and birds and fishes. So I had wow. a big passion for animals. And eventually Aww. I grew to horses. <laughs> I saw that. That's quite impressive. Yeah, so I started with my first own horse when I was 12 that I've saved up to buy. It was a wild, non-trained horse because I was able to get a very cheap. <laughs> but I trained her up and I started building this horse business. So by the time I was 19, I had a follow-up riding school, adventure rides. I went a year to business school to understand business and marketing and all of that. Wow. I was loving, loving, loving my life as it was living in Sweden. But what happened was that I met my husband when I was 22, Aww. decided to sell all of my horses to be able to go and start another chapter of my life, which would be creating a family. I've always had a big dream of being a young mom. I was just mm. struggling with finding Mr. Right. So when I found him, I decided <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to follow him. So I sold my horses. Aww. Is he American? Is he, American? Uh, he is Norwegian. half American, half Norwegian. So I met him actually oh, wow. in Sweden because he came over with some friends to go to go out yeah. dancing. And um, yeah. <laughs> but wait, is he um, like, was he born in America or was he born in Norway? So he was born in America. He had an American dad, uh, but they moved okay. when he was a year old. They moved to Austria and Switzerland and oh, was okay. living down there. So he's also German speaking. And okay. then they moved back to Norway a little bit later. So, and that's where okay. I met him when he was in Norway. Oh, how lovely. Yeah. 
And how did you get into the actual health industry? Because you're obviously living on this beautiful, you have this beautiful farm in Sweden. And, and, and yeah, what was the, you know, the move from entrepreneur to the health space? Yes. So after I met my husband, I moved to Norway. We actually ended up moving a little bit back and forth because of his job, but I decided to start having kids. So I had my first son when I was 25 years old, and uh, after that, my health started declining. Oh. I was diagnosed with shingles, but I, they misdiagnosed me, so I wasn't able to get medication in time, and uh, I was in so, so, so much pain. I wasn't able wow. to functioning. I was like sitting naked on a couch. I couldn't have any blankets or any clothing on because I was in so much pain. Oh. My husband had to take off work to be able to take care of our son because I couldn't hold him. I couldn't carry him. Wow. It was, that was the time when I started researching about our immune system. Because I was mm. like, why is my immune system like a 65 year old but I am 25, I'm eating healthy, I am living a healthy lifestyle. I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't mm. do anything to intoxicate my body. I was trying to live a very non-toxic life. My kid didn't even get toys that was in plastic because I've been reading up so much on all the harmful substances that are used. So I felt like I should have the best opportunity to have a very healthy body and still I was so sick. So that started creating curiosity of immune system and cellular health and so on. But being a mom, my life was busy and I ended up having my second child. When I had him, my body became very sensitive and I developed grass and pollen allergy but then it mm -hmm. became a cross allergy to all fruits and half of the veggies. So my body was just overreacting to everything and I was sick a lot and I would just get sick with one thing after another and my body did not want to recover wow. in between, it felt like. So I was in a very frustrating place right then. Yeah. I had already started studying to become a nutritionist by then because something else happened mm -hmm. in between that triggered my um, interest for nutrition even more. Mm -hmm. That was that my mom, she was diagnosed with colon cancer. Oh, jeez, I'm sorry. When my mom was diagnosed with colon cancer, first of all, you don't know if she will survive or not. And I was just mm -hmm. researching everything regarding nutrition. What can we do? what can be potentially affecting and maybe killing off the cancer naturally. And I was just researching mm -hmm. a lot. And I found so much information that was so exciting. When other people sit and watch Netflix mm -hmm. in the nights, I'm sitting on Google Scholar and PubMed and is reading scientific <laughs> reports. <laughs> but I was able to create this uh, program for my mom and she was able to thrive through her colon cancer. She was able to handle it very well and, and she did not need any chemo. Wow. It was just the opening phase of me understanding how interesting this is and how good I am at connecting the dots. And that's when I was yeah. like, okay, I need to go back to university to go back and study nutrition because I've been struggling trying to find what, will I, what do I want to do when I grow old, you know, <laughs> when I'm an adult. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I found nutrition because of that. Wow. But I was very frustrated because I was able to help my mom so good. And then I helped my dad with his high blood pressure. And I started helping friends and family with their nutritional intake and improving their health. Mm -hmm. But everything I knew, my body did not react to it. It did not respond to it. So I just kept on getting sicker and sicker for every pregnancy, for every year that went by, I kept on getting sicker. Mm -hmm. So I was done to, I mean, I became a nutritionist. And after that, have, I have my third baby. After I had my third child, uh, I was laying on the couch. And uh, mm -hmm. suddenly I just hear a snap sound in my back of my skull, like neck. And then I felt a little burning sensation oh my from my head going down my spine. And... No one knows. 
but I could not move. I felt like I was paralyzed. And even if my, oh my phone gosh. was just like a hand away from my hand, I wasn't able to reach it because I was completely locked into the position. I felt like I was paralyzed. I was in excruciating pain. Oh my gosh. It was so frustrating. And no one knew. And my husband got back home three hours later. So I was like, please change the diaper of the baby. Come back and help me. Wow. After he came back to help me, I, he helped me stand up. And I was like, okay, I can stand on my feet. I can move my head when I was standing completely straight up. Mm -hmm. So I told him to just help me to bed. I got stuck in bed for three days. I couldn't move. I eventually went into the doctor's. And the doctors could not find a reason for my pain. They did MRIs. They did all kind of testing. They did, did even do check for cancer wow. in my brain and so on. And they couldn't find a reason for my pain. Gosh, that's scary. So that thing, I kept on struggling with my chronic neck pain for over two years. And mm -hmm. I... It was so devastating for me that we actually ended up moving back to Scandinavia because we were living in the United States by that time. And all foods we were eating was healthy. Yeah. They were grass-fed organic beef. We were eating all wow. the veggies came from a community farm. We did everything I knew to do with supplementation, with nutrition, I was living a clean life, but still my body kept on getting sicker and sicker and it was more and more painful and I couldn't function. So that's why I have unique knowledge today because I had to dig so deep in my own health to try to solve that, that I today are 100% pain free again and I'm having a life that I'm thriving and I, I keep on feeling stronger and stronger and healthier and healthier for every year versus just seeing the decline. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> that's what's inspired me to get into nutrition. <laughs> wow. And that's why I'm mean, so passionate about it. <laughs> okay. So, so what, that's so interesting. Okay. So let's just go back to exactly. So you had the shingles. Let's re like, we'll go through that again. So mm -hmm. you had the shingles, uh, you were really ill. You, when you tried to change your diet, did, did, did you see the improvement of the shingles? Like, did it improve? I was already no? eating healthy. So okay. I, I was already then, eating very healthy, uh, so mm -hmm. I didn't, I mean, I tried different supplementation. I didn't see any improvement. Like I tried a couple of things, but it, my body did just not respond too much. Wow. And even if I followed all the textbooks, like what you should do, I was researching and reading books from experts and I tried to implement it to my life. Nothing seemed to help me. And that's what was so wow. frustrating. But the shingles was yeah. just a precursor of everything else that was going to happen. Well, I was just going to say, so then, and then you had the pregnancies, you had very difficult pregnancies. Mm -hmm. And then you obviously had your mother's really, you know, illness. You helped her through that. You created a sort of diet plan, nutrition plan on your own with your own knowledge and, you know, researching and, and you were able to help her. And then... You, but you were still kind of struggling with your own health, even though you were like following all the textbook, you know, eat clean, buy organic, grass fed, et cetera, et cetera. And so what was the turning point? What was there like a one thing that you did and it was like, okay, or was it a culmination of things that then you were able to? Yeah, of course my body... It's a combination, but I was already doing most of it. So I was still lacking some essential building blocks and puzzle mm -hmm. pieces into my health journey. And uh, what really was a turnaround for me was that I found a blood test that could measure how many pro versus anti-inflammatory building blocks I have in my system. Mm -hmm. And when I was able to measure that, I could also correct it. But it was frustrating to see my blood work because... I mean, I've been going to doctors so many times and they always says everything looks perfect. Everything is fine. We don't understand why you're sick. Uh, your pain is probably up in your head. You probably need a psychologist. So that's what the doctors eventually ended wow. up saying because they did not know what else they could do for me except giving me wow. pain medication. And I did not want pain medication because I was 
breastfeeding my little daughters, I just tried to suffer through the pain instead because I did not want to take drugs. Wow. Wow. That's a, okay, so that blood test, it measures inflammation in the body. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So it measures how many and, pro versus yeah. anti-inflammatory building blocks. So uh, there are different ways of measuring inflammation in your body. Uh, the way doctors do it is mm -hmm. measuring how much inflammation is going on in your blood. So how many precursors you have and so on. Uh, but this one is going in more into how many pro versus anti-inflammatory building blocks are your cell membrane built up with. Because if we're having too many mm. pro-inflammatory building blocks, we have a chronic, low-groided chronic inflammation going on in our system. And uh, since it's on a cellular level, every single cell building up our body, so even the cells in our gut, is built up with these cells. So if we're having low-graded chronic inflammation, that will also affect our gut health and our brain health wow. and our eyes and our skin and everything that we have on our body. Fantastic. I mean, it's good to know that that's a measure that we can use in order to assess our own overall well-being. And, and so I think this is a great segue into, into the topic of today, which is gut health. I hear so much about gut health. It's everywhere. It's social media. It's in the news. Everyone's talking about gut health. And it feels like there's so many misconceptions and myths. So my question would be, can you, with your, obviously you're a nutritionist, you're very well versed and you're an expert in this area, can you describe in very simple terms what gut health is? So gut health, what is it when we are having a healthy gut? When we have a healthy gut, it's working. That's what a healthy gut is. And for it to be able to work, there need to be some components there. We need to have a good balance of good gut bacteria. And we need to try to limit the bad gut bacteria as much as possible. But we have about 300 to 1,000 different species of gut bacteria in our system. And how many good versus bad, it all depends on our diet that we're eating. So if we are eating a lot of carbohydrates, if we're drinking a lot of alcohol, if we're drinking a lot of processed foods, if we're drink, eating things with additives and so on, all of that contributes to feeding and having I mean, feeding the bad gut bacteria. But when we're able to change our diet to more whole foods, to more um, healthy meats and healthy fish and healthy, I mean, fruit and veggies, then our microbiome will change. A lot of people are thinking that just by taking a pill, probiotics, that your, mic that your microbiome will change. There are some studies talking about that it can help, but there is also many, many studies showing that it does not help. Because a lot of the times when we're taking just the bacteria, the probiotics, is that when we're swallowing it, those are foreigners. And a lot of the times our own gut bacteria can kill the foreigners because they don't like them, they don't recognize them. Another thing that can happen is that bacteria lives a very short lifespan. They only are alive for about two mil, I mean two hours on average. So when you are having them in a pill form, you either have to put them into a trance so that they are not alive, and then and usually those are um, bacteria that need to be refrigerated, so they are coming down to a temperature which make them not be alive and not die, and then we're swallowing them. But there is some problems with that too, because a lot of the times they may not be woken up before they pass out again. So a lot of like okay. the supplementation with probiotics, they are not giving us that effect we want. So I always recommend people to eat more fermented foods, eat more foods that have a natural good bacteria flora. So eating more kefir, kimchi, kombucha, and uh, things in our diet that have a good, um, yeah, have lots of bacteria for us that are natural. And should we be eating like a lot of it, like almost an excess of it to have it, an impact? And how long do we have to eat these, these items and take supplements in order to actually see a difference in the biome and the balance? Uh, that's a good question. And that is also very individual. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, envisioners. <laughs> 
So it's very individual depending on what you're doing the rest of the time. If you're only adding more bacteria, but you're not eating, adding the foods that good gut bacteria can eat to metabolize butyric acid, for example, then it's gonna take a long time for you to build up a good bacteria flora. Think about it as rabbits. You can have rabbits in a cage. And if you add more rabbits to that cage, there will be more rabbits in the cage, but unless you feed them, they will die off. So it doesn't matter how many rabbits you keep on putting into the cage if you don't feed them anything. Oh my gosh, that's so interesting. Yeah, but on the other aspect of it is if you have a cage, you have two rabbits, a male and a female. If you start feeding them, they can start duplicating. And eventually they start duplicating really fast as long as you keep on feeding them. So a lot of the time it is more important to feed the good gut bacteria we have than maybe adding more bacteria in. A lot of people are adding more bacteria in without feeding them. So that is a big problem we have. So you can do a lot of probiotics every single day, but unless you're able to get some prebiotics into your diet too, it's not going to help you. Wow. That is such a good, that was such a good metaphor. And now I understand gut health. <laughs> I probably don't. I understand a little bit. I understand. Now I understand like the functioning element of what gut health is based on that. That was a really good analogy. So the prebiotics and the probiotics. So can you also maybe explain that? Because what's the difference between the prebiotic and the probiotic? Yeah. So the probiotic is the bacteria they survive. The prebiotics is just the food for the good gut bacteria. And there are different types of prebiotics. You find prebiotics in green bananas, you find it in inulin, you find it in chicory root, you find it in flax seeds, you find it in many different areas. But the problem mm. is when we are having a balanced diet and we're getting two little prebiotic fibers and you're feeding the bad gut bacteria a little bit more, maybe you're having bread in the mornings, you're feeding them processed carbs and wheat and gluten. And then you might have had a salad for lunch, but then for dinner, you're having a hamburger meal. I don't know. But the thing is that happens is that every meal we're eating, we just tend to feed the bad gut bacteria a little bit more than the good because it's so hard to get enough of the good things into our system when we are also mm -hmm. adding bad things. So mm -hmm. a lot of the problems is even if you are trying your best to eat as many fruit and veggies as possible, as long as we have been over time been feeding the bad gut bacteria, they are so predominant in our gut that they, are, they keep on kicking out the good gut bacteria because there is no space for them because they are there. And as long as they get fed, they keep on conquering the space we have in our gut. Wow. So that is a problem. So sometimes we need to come in with targeted solutions to boost up our prebiotic fiber intake. So wow. I encourage everyone to eat as much as possible, but sometimes supplementation can be beneficial to just be able to get over the hump and push out the bad gut bacteria and create a better environment for our good ones. Wow, that's so interesting. And again, depending on maybe how long you've been dealing with these, the, the good and bad, like, let's say you have a bad gut mm -hmm. or bad, more bad gut bacteria than good gut bacteria. Will that also affect, um, how quickly you can turn things around? Or again, I know you said it's individual, but I guess I'm just trying to, is there any, are there any markers that can help us to kind of gauge how long I should be doing this for to see a, a difference? Like for some people, will it be five days and then others will be like five months? Or what, what do you think? Usually it's somewhere between three weeks to see, to start feeling a change up to six months. Some people, it depends on what you are. I have had people that needed 11 months before they started like seeing their IBS change and their eczema go down and so on. Wow. Because a lot of the times our gut health issues are showing symptoms in other forms. A lot of people are struggling with gut health doesn't know that they're struggling with gut health. You don't need to have diarrhea, constipation, or being bloated to have a gut issue. But if you are struggling mm -hmm. with skin, you're struggling with sleep, mood, anxiety, depression, all of that can also be due to leaky gut. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people are struggling with gut health issues and especially like eczema, 
Allergies are also, especially food intolerances, is a gut health issue. Understanding everything I understand wow. today, I've always been struggling with the gut health issue. Yeah. And the main reason for me struggling with that is that my parents kept on feeding me bread every single day. They did not know that I had a gluten sensitivity. I did not know it myself because that was my everyday. So I did not know a difference. Yes. Right, right. Over time, looking back, when you are struggling with it for so long and you're struggling with leaky gut, um, so we can back down and say, talk a little bit about leaky gut too. So people yes. get the context yes. of what is leaky gut. Please. Yes. So in your gut, you have your cell walls, mm -hmm. okay? So the whole gut is built up with cells and it's only one cell thick. So it's a very, th a very, very thin wall. And if you are taking okay. the whole gut and unfold it, it's big as a tennis court. Wow. So it's a very big area, but it gets crumbled down into the gut we have. Mm -hmm. Our gut is very sensitive because it's only one cell thick and the epicells mm -hmm. needs to be able to be like glued together. Okay. What is happening when we're struggling with leaky gut is that those cells, they open up. So two big particles of foods, bacteria, it can be good bacteria, it can be bad bacteria, it can be healthy foods, it can be unhealthy foods, but two big particles and things that are not supposed to end up in our bloodstream is going out directly in our bloodstream. Wow. And that is what's causing our immune system to work on an overload. And uh, people are struggling with, like I said, food, food sensitivities or immune issue, autoimmune diseases and so on. It is often due to the leaky gut our immune system keeps wow. on attacking. And so the leaky gut, just getting back to that, when you said like you, you were eating a lot of bread every day, mm -hmm. the refined carbohydrates, because you, ha you already have a gluten sensitivity, what that was contributing to like the breakdown of that thin cell and different molecules, particles going through into your bloodstream. And then your, your immune system was on overdrive trying to get rid of whatever's in the bloodstream. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, kind wow. of. <laughs> so the cells are opening up. When, and what's happening when we're talking about gluten in particular, so inside of our gut wall, there, where our cells are building up our gut, we have something called the gut lining, uh, the mucosa. And the mucosa is a slimy layer that is supposed to protect our gut wall from damage because when we're eating food, our food is broken down in, in acids. And those acids are coming a little bit with the food when it's transported down. And uh, for that to not damage the, the cell wall, we need to have the mucosa. Mm. And the mucosa, what is happening when we're eating gluten is that our gluten is, usually gluten is a protein that most people are reacting negatively to. Mm -hmm. And our immune system to fight the gluten is on the other side of the wall of the mucosa. So gluten okay. and our immune system is fighting through the wall and eventually we break hole in the mucosa. Wow. So that is a, one of the reasons why we are struggling a lot with leaky gut because today, first of all, the bread we are eating today, the wheat we're using, have 800 times more gluten content in it today than it used to have. Wow. So having gluten in your diet, and you're not only eating it once a day, uh, we're usually eating it for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, even for, even for evening snack. And then we're also getting it through our makeup and skincare, and there is gluten in so many things today. Really? Yeah, you can, <laughs> you can read into that what? too. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. There are okay. so many ways we are exposed to gluten mm -hmm. today. And for most people, it is too, too much. Yeah, it sounds like it. I didn't even realize it happens in makeup and, and body products and all these things. I assume that's really crazy because I also have a gluten sensitivity. I didn't know I... Well, I, I've self-diagnosed myself as having a gluten. But I, I will say, whenever I have gluten, I get super bloated. I gain weight very quickly. 
I feel lethargic. It's affecting all the, you know, traditional, just not well, just my, my overall well being. But then the minute I cut it out and I'm eating, you know, the more organic, like whole foods, basically nothing that's refined immediately. I'm like, I got energy. I'm like, I, I can do anything. So it's really interesting. <laughs> so when we're looking at having healthy gut too, it is so important to target our gut health also from repairing the mucosa. And that, mm -hmm. they, that can be very hard to do just by eating healthy because what's already damaged is damaged. And it can be hard to eat enough of prebiotic fiber and stimulate to get enough of butyric acid for the mucosa to get repaired. So that is what we usually have to focus a lot on when we're struggling with our gut. And it's usually a project that takes some time. Yeah. But the benefits of having a healthy gut, you can see the benefits on your whole body. And would you say the mucosa is like, is that the, essentially the thing that we should be focusing on? And that is where cellular health can really come in to play? Because I know you're really big on cellular health as well. Is there a tie between that as well? Yeah, the cellular health mm. is helping our cells in our gut to create a good environment for our good gut bacteria to thrive. When we're able to lower the inflammation all over, we're going to be able to also have better functioning cells. Because what is the function of a cell? We, that is to create energy. It is to have the, keep the DNA safe. But what is happening when we are having too many pro-inflammatory building blocks, not only do we have low-grade chronic inflammation, but what is also happening is that our hormone receptors that are on top of our cells. They get numbed mm. out. So mm. people are struggling with a lot of low-grade chronic inflammation. They're more prone for insulin resistance, thyroid issue, and everything they have with hormones to do. Wow. But when we're talking about the mucosa, the mucosa helps protect the cell wall layer of the gut mm -hmm. lining. But then again, when we have been able to improve our cellular health, we have improved our gut health overall, then we also have to make sure that we're having enough of components for our gut to be able to do its job and for the gut to be able to absorb the nutrients. So then we start talking about, do we break down the food properly? Do we have the enzymes that should cut down the food in proper pieces? Mm -hmm. And do we have them? Do we have the bacteria to do the job yeah. and absorb? Are we able to absorb the nutrients? Yeah. So there is a lot of different components when we're talking about gut health. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like we're just, we're scratching the surface, but we're still getting so much information. So I, I can appreciate why, I mean, it's just great to have someone like with your expertise on who can give us an overview of it. And then I think hopefully some of the listeners, I will share all of your social media handles. They can follow you and go on your website and learn more because it is prob it's a deep dive, right? That people have to go into mm -hmm. and, and there's so many components, like you said. Okay. Well, why don't we just go through a couple of myths, right? And you can tell me if they're actually real. Okay. So first, well, I don't know if they're myths, but they're, they're definitely like statements or, you know, out there. And let's, you tell me if you think this is true or not. First one, a gluten-free diet is the way to good gut health. Is that true or false? It's true unless you are changing your gluten-free diet to with other highly processed foods. Okay. So if you're able to do a gluten-free diet and just reduce the gluten with whole foods, but if you're just going to mm -hmm. go to the gluten-free aisle in the store and just eat 80% of gluten-free products that are still processed, <laughs> then I don't know which one is better or not. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That's good. That's a good answer. Okay, second one. All bacteria and the gut is harmful. I'm going to answer that because I think based on our conversation, I can probably say that's false, right? Because there's good bacteria and bad bacteria, right? Exactly. <laughs> ah, Michaela, I'm learning. This is good. <laughs> okay, third one. Cleanses and juices are needed to have good gut health. It, yeah, it depends on what your diet is overall. <laughs> a lot of people are talking about detoxing. A lot of people are talking about flushing out. And yes, it is good to flush out what we have in our gut. Mm -hmm. But we, it's also important to do parasite cleansing every now and then. That is mm, another whole topic, but yeah, yes, but that yes, is yes, also yes. so 
because a lot of people are having different organisms living inside of you, taking a lot of the nutrients that we're supposed to absorb and use for ourselves, and they're just sitting in there eating up a lot of the foods we are eating. So are they needed for good gut health? Not necessarily if you're having an overall good, healthy diet. Can mm-hmm. they be beneficial? Yeah, they can be beneficial. Mm-hmm. But it depends also what kind of juicing you are doing. Is it mainly sugar? Because what's happening when you're juicing things, when you're putting the fruits and berries into a blender, you are destroying the fibers that comes with it. And it spikes okay. your blood sugar a lot. And depending if you have a functioning liver, because the liver is the one that needs to break down all the fruit sugar. If you have a functioning liver, it could be beneficial, but it can also spike and give you so much sugar that feeds the bad gut bacteria in a way. So it is also a question that is problematic because it's not just like mm-hmm. you can do a juice cleanse and be all healthy again if you go back to bad habits. What I want to focus on is simply create good habits around food nutrition that makes sure that we have all the essentials. Because if we have all the essential vitamins, minerals, proteins, and fatty acids, our body is really good at detoxing itself. Our body is really good at healing. And yeah, I always tell this that like, this is my theme on my website too, like the body self healing under the right circumstances. So if we create better circumstances, then our body is able to heal better. A hundred percent. I agree. Yeah, I I agree. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So your top five. Sorry, it's not that easy. (laughs) No, it's not an easy question. (laughs) No, but it's actually really good. And I liked how you answered those. I, I think that's right. There is no writer. I mean, there's no very clear answer that's applicable to everyone. And I think that your answers and what you've shared today has shown that to everyone. Like you've, you've shared that really eloquently. So thank you for that. Okay, so before we get to the Envisioner Questioner section, if listeners are saying, yes, okay, Michaela, I want to know how do I start this? Like I want to start today. What are your top five tips for achieving good gut health, like now, to anyone listening. So we need more essential fatty acids. We need more omega-3 into our system because that is a part of building up every cell membrane. So that is one thing. Just observe, like just know that most omega-3 supplements don't work. So you have to go out and do a bunch of research. You need to find an omega-3 supplementation that have high polyphenol content. A lot of omega-3s use vitamin E, then they're not bioavailable. That is another episode (laughs) on why, but just trust me. And then we need to make sure that we are eating more probiotic foods. We need to eat more prebiotic, either through our food or maybe through a supplementation. Mm -hmm. We need vitamin D, Mm because vitamin D is very important for our gut health. But vitamin D cannot be activated in our gut unless we have magnesium. Wow. So for us to have a healthy level of vitamin D, we also need magnesium. Okay. That's great. I didn't know that. I didn't know they work in combination like that. Yeah. And would you recommend supplements for like magnesium and vitamin D or are we going outside and eating chocolate? <laughs> I would love to say that we could just eat chocolate all day long. <laughs> but... <laughs> It is kind of hard to get enough of magnesium, even with the amount of chocolate we are eating. (laughs) (laughs) Most people are magnesium deficient Mm -hmm. and it can be hard to just eat it through our diet. And the biggest reason, if we would be eating a perfect diet, we wouldn't need as many nutrients. But because we're eating diets that are rich in carbohydrates and things, they are making us malnourished of zinc and magnesium because it takes so much of them. Wow. So that is why we need higher levels of zinc and magnesium today to be able to compensate for the diet. So in a perfect world, I would say you don't need supplementation, just go back to eating organ meats. But a lot of people are not willing to go back and eat organ meats. So then we might need supplementation. Oh, so there's a lot of magnesium in organ meats. It's a lot of vitamins and minerals in general that are very easily absorbed for us in liver, in brain, in intestines. Yeah. I love liver. 
And um, you do. Yeah, I, I, wish always I, could. Ha- I always have. I always have. I don't know why as a child. So now like when my husband ever makes like a roast chicken, I get dibs on the, uh, <laughs> on the liver and the heart. Oh, anyway, that's kind of gross, but not, it's not gross. It's not gross, but you know. No, we need to take away that, that thing because everyone is thinking that yeah. way and that's what's prohibiting people to eat it, but it's very good for us. Yeah. And it's not wasteful of the chicken. So there you go. <laughs> okay, right. Now we're going to move on to the Envisionaire questionnaire. And this is the final part. So thank you so much for everything you shared on gut health. We asked guests three questions reflecting on their past, present, and future. And so what I wanted to ask you is looking back towards your past, if you could give your 15-year-old self any advice, what would it be and why? Start learning about nutrition faster. <laughs> I could have it. That's a good if answer. I knew, yeah, if I knew everything today, I was like, it's a lot of things I wouldn't have to suffer through if I knew that. But <laughs> yeah. And how should she do that? How should your 15 year old self do that? Oh, yeah, that can be problematic. The testing I'm using today wasn't. <laughs> You couldn't get a hold of that then, but maybe at least quit gluten, <laughs> quit bread. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I mean, really a 50 year old could do that at least. <laughs> yes, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> okay. Reflecting in the present moment, if you could seek advice from anyone in the world, who would it be and why? Ooh, juicy. Mm. <laughs> anyone in the world. Yeah, anyone in the world. Now my brain is spinning around because now I'm like, I have a very big passion for nutrition, but I also have a very big passion for uh, entrepreneurship and helping. I mean, I want women to be able to feel safe and secure. So now I'm like, who who would I pick about all, of all the people I could choose from? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Uh, it's a hard question. It's a hard question. It is a very hard question. I mean, can I say myself? I was just going to say, yeah, I was just going to say, who's like the, if you did like a Venn diagram, who's in the middle of you, you're the, yeah. <laughs> maybe you in like, you in like, in like two years or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah. Me, myself in 20 years, I will have so much knowledge then that <laughs> it will be crazy. <laughs> Love it. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, that's good. Okay, cool. Well, we'll take that as the answer then. <laughs> future looking what's one goal that you want to achieve in the next five years I want to change the way we're looking at health today we are looking at health as like here is an issue here is a solution but I want people to start asking more why 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 so if you are struggling with uh, gut issues ask why and then okay I've been eating too much fried food why and then like really boil it down to what and how is that affecting your gut and why is that something you need to target and so on but I just want to change the conversation because the conversation I've been so many years around weight if you have a healthy Mm -hmm. weight you seem to be a healthy person but that doesn't have anything to do with health to do we need to start thinking about that our body is built up with cells so healthy body begins with healthy cell Mm-hmm. And when we're able to ask enough of why questions, we always come down to the cell. Is our cells working? Are they functioning? So I want to change the way we're looking at health. I love that. Well, you're on your way. You're on your way, Michaela. You are. Yeah. So, and, <laughs> well, and I, I, I was going to share this in, the, in just, you know, when we're wrapping up, but um, you have a podcast that's going to be coming out shortly and I'm really excited to hear it. And it's, going to, I'm sure it's going to be again about that sharing of knowledge. And so you are creating that dialogue and that awareness. So that's really cool. I'm excited to see what happens in the next five years. Yes, it's going to be an amazing tool to reach out to more people and especially reach out to those people that are struggling so much with their health and their doctor says everything is fine and they still feel like crap and there is no one out there rooting for them, seeing them, understanding them. So I want to be able to reach, in particular, those people because I was one of those people. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a great goal. 
Well, thank you so much, Michaela, for being part of the Envisioner podcast. I really, really appreciate you talking to us about gut health. And we did such a, I mean, if, for me, it felt like a deep dive, but I'm sure it was just touching, you know, the surface. Uh, but I do really, really appreciate it. And I know the listeners have gotten a lot from your expertise. So thank you for sharing your time with us. And for anyone who is interested, any Envisioners interested in connecting with Michaela and learning about her work, I really encourage you guys to go to her website, www.foodchangeslives.com. So foodchangeslives.com. I'll leave all the links to her social media. She's very active on social media, so definitely reach out to her. And her new podcast is going to be called Body Hacking, Build a Better You. And again, check that out. She's going to launch it, and we're all going to be very excited to, to listen and learn more. And I will leave all the links in the show notes and and definitely follow her on social media so that you can keep up to date with when the podcast launches and all the offerings that she has, her knowledge. And so thank you again, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure you hit subscribe and check out this video here.